We are here in Florida to be one of the first in the world to ride the all new Triumph TF250X motocross bike. And I feel like I'm in a very unique position to test this bike. Thanks to our adventures on this channel, I'm going to be able to compare this bike against an eclectic group of machines from motocross history. Over the last year, we've been on a mission to tell as many interesting motocross stories as possible. And that's led to me riding some of the weirdest, and let's be honest, worst dirt bikes of all time. And quite a few of those bikes have come from mainstream motorcycle manufacturers. It's been quite the ride, and all of that experience has led to this moment here in Florida. How will the Triumph compare to the likes of the Aprilia, or the BMW, or even the Cannondale? Will history be repeating itself here, or will the TF250X be something else entirely? I'll be thinking about that during my ride, obviously as well as rating the new machine against the modern day competition. But the big question for me is, is it finally time for a road bike company to find success in the dirt? Let's find out. Although the story of the TF250X doesn't begin here in the Sunshine States, but a very, very long way away. The story of the brand new and very exciting Triumph motocross bike began here in Leicestershire, England, the epicenter of the UK motorcycle industry. Triumph are the largest UK owned motorcycle manufacturer and they are big players in the road bike world. They have the distinction of being the second oldest manufacturer to have continuously produced motorcycles, only behind Royal Enfield. They clearly have a deep and rich history and racing has played a major part in that story over the years. The origins of Triumph date back to the late 1800s when a German fellow called Siegfried Bettmann relocated to the UK. Bettmann first started using the Triumph name in 1887, but at first they were involved in the bicycle business. It wasn't until the early 1900s, 1901 or 1902, that Triumph came out with their first motorcycle. It was powered by a Belgian-made Minerva engine. 1905 saw the introduction of the first Triumph motorcycle with a Triumph engine. And by 1907, Triumph were producing 1,000 units per year from their Coventry-based factory. Operations soon ramped up when the First World War broke out. And over the course of four years, Triumph produced 30,000 machines, like this one, the Trusty, for British and Allied forces. Motorcycles only became more popular after the war, and by 1929, Triumph were producing 30,000 units per year. And through this time, racing was playing a big role in the story of Triumph. In 1908, Triumph claimed their very first race win at the Isle of Man TT with a new lap record as well. This kick-started a long love affair with the island and led to many, many race wins. More recently, the likes of Peter Hickman and Bruce Anstey have both raced for Triumph on the island. But it wasn't just the TT where Triumph found success. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, Triumph mounted riders continually tried to smash land speed world records. And that was a tradition that continued into the 21st century with Guy Martin and this Ponkers machine. Triumph also found success in America. In 1966 and 1967, Triumph riders Buddy Elmore and Gary Nixon won the Daytona 200 on this, the Triumph Daytona 500 which seems very relevant because we'll be just a stone's throw away from the beach in a few minutes' time. But this is a motocross video, so do Triumph have any pedigree in the dirt? Well, there have been plenty of Triumph-powered dirt bikes throughout history. In fact, throughout the first 50 years of the International Six Days Trial, from the very first edition in 1913, Triumph were heavily involved in that prestigious event. The British brand won plenty of laurels over the years. 
And famously, in 1948, Alan Jeffries, mounted on board his triumph, led Team Great Britain to overall victory. And that triumph, pardon the pun, led to the creation of the TR5 Trophy Model, which was a bike that many riders used for scrambling and trials. In the 50s, Triumph was sold to BSA for £2.5 million, and initially things went very well. But by the early 1970s, BSA were in trouble, and in 1973, they went bankrupt. A new company was formed to keep the Triumph train steaming ahead. But that company, NVT, wasn't destined to last long either. They collapsed in 1977. Things got a little messy and confusing after that, but bikes were still coming off the production line, albeit in very small numbers. In 1983, an English businessman called John Bloor came along to save the company. He bought the name and the manufacturing rights to keep the historic brand alive. Over the years, Bloor built Triumph back up to its former glory, reportedly spending £80 million on the company before it turned a profit again in the year 2000. Today, Bloor's son, Nick, is the CEO of Triumph, and from where I stand, the brand seemingly has never been stronger. All of that history has led us here, to this machine. But why motocross, and why now? Well, we're going to get the answer to those questions when we sit down with some of the minds behind this project. But those guys are in Florida already. So let's go to the airport, catch a plane, and head to Gatorback Cycle Park. the company Triumph so far in this video, but let's talk about the bike. This before me is the Triumph TF250X, a ground up project from Triumph. They was keen to tell us yesterday in the press conference that it's not a rebadged anything. This is their own project, their own build. They've built it from the ground up and no expense has been spared. It's packed full of tech. It's got all the features you could ever ask for on a 250 motocross bike and they've worked with literally the best in the business, Ricky Carmichael, along with a whole host of test riders such as Ivan Tedesco, Clement DeSalle, to develop this bike and make it the best motorcycle that they possibly can. I'll go through the full specs in a second, but the headline figures for me, this thing is punching 48 horsepower, the best in the class. It's 104 kg wet, and uh, that is a joint first in the class. Those two figures together mean that this machine has the best power to weight ratio in the 250 four stroke category. Let's run through the rest of the bike and show you some of the features and components of the all new Triumph TF250X. So let me just run through some of the key specs and components of the Triumph TF250X. We've got a forged Koenig piston, a cylinder head manufactured in-house for accuracy and control. The crankcases are also fully machined in-house and form an integral part of chassis stiffness and geometry. It's a five-speed gearbox with specially treated teeth for durability, a quick shifter for clutchless gear changes between second and fifth gear, an electric start of course. We see tool free air filter access with that vented airbox as well. In terms of engine management, Triumph have decided to team up with Athena. We see magnesium engine covers, a lightweight race tuned exhaust system. There's launch control, traction control, as well as app controlled engine management. We've got DID Dirt Star rims, Pirelli Scorpion MX tires, Brembo calipers, Galfa discs, KYB coil suspension, neck and yokes, Pro Taper bars. ODI lock-on grips and a lightweight aluminium frame with a central spine and twin cradles. As you can see from this comprehensive list of top-end components, there's been no expense spared in the development of this machine. the 
drive launch, testing the 250. Run! For the first time, it is a very clear to see from the whole presentation this week here in Florida that Triumph are all in on motocross, on dirt bikes. Obviously with the production of this machine, they've also got a 450 in the works coming at the end of the year. As well as the bikes that they produce, they're investing in the sport as well. They've got a facility up in Georgia, not too far away from where we are now. They spent a lot of money on having a proper HQ here in the States. First impressions of their bike are good. So the, the map switch, there's two map settings. Map one is a aggressive race map. Map two is much softer for those. Slicker conditions maybe for riders that don't want such a hard hit. Triumph are serious about motocross, they're serious about dirt bikes. That's evidently clear here with their first attempt at TF250X. It doesn't feel like their first attempt and that is maybe the highest praise I can give to this bike right now. That might be an insult to the awesome engineers at Triumph, but I've ridden bikes from road bike manufacturers in the past that definitely feel a bit experimental. That is not this. Let's carry on riding, shall we? Okay, so I've just spun some laps on the TF250X for the first time around here at Gatorback Cycle Park. You heard some of my first reactions around this awesome track on the British made bike. But why have Triumph decided to jump into dirt bikes and why now? I'm gonna to talk to some of the key personnel behind the project to find out those answers. So let's head to the pits and talk to some of those guys now. You've done a lot in your career, right? You've done a lot of cool things. Yes, sir. Where does being involved in a project from the start, where does this project rank in all the things you've done in your career? It's extremely, extremely gratifying, humbling, and it's probably one of the top things that I've done in my career because I've never been a part of starting something from the ground up uh, with such an iconic brand. It was fun. It was exciting and one of, the, one of the most special things that I've ever been a part of throughout my career and it came at such a great time. Yesterday in the presentation you guys made a big deal of saying that you were all in on dirt bikes. Why motocross? Why now? Why have Triumph made this big commitment to our sport? So the biggest thing for us is obviously bringing Triumph to a whole new audience. It allows us to expand into a younger demographic of customer. You know, we know that the motocross and off-road enduro customer is much younger than our normal Triumph customer and it's not really until we break into a, a, a new kind of segment of the market that we can look to expand our customer base and that means we can introduce them to Triumph as a brand and hopefully hold on to them you know through through their journey of buying motorcycles whether that be carrying on with dirt bikes or maybe transitioning across to another product. Why did you decide these guys, I want to join these guys on this journey. Well, the, the reason, number one, because of the iconic brand and the people. We all deal with these companies and, and, and you have sponsors, but you know, fortunately for me, I'm in an area where I don't have to do yeah. certain things and I want to be a part of, of, of brands that I enjoy the internal group. When we had further talks, I just, you know, they kept, uh, they kept exceeding all of my expectations and they just, everyone was so genuine and I'm like, man, I, I just really want to be a part of this. And they were super receptive of what I had to say and not that everything that I say is right. I know that for sure, but they were just, well, yeah, they were listening, super receptive. Every time we told them what we recommended or this is the path that we recommend you guys take a look at, they never 
never batted an eye and they were completely committed. I had a great feeling and that goes back to the people, you know, the internal group, the people that we were going to be dealing with on the day to day. And you, you, you have trust in those people and um, it just, it, it seemed like a no brainer at the time. At the concept of the project, what was the thing that you were chasing? Were you trying to disrupt the class, disrupt the market, or were you just, mm. let's just make the best 250 motocross bike we can? We wanted to do something that was a bit unique to us, you know, so we've done that with what we've chosen with the chassis uh, in terms of the layout of the frame. We've wanted to make sure that we are giving people the best that they can get, basically. So we think, you know, for the the price of the bike and the componentry that they've got on it, as well as then the combination of the you know, best in class power and as light as the lightest bike in class. You can't ask for a better bike to go out on ride at the moment. How much goat DNA does this bike have? <laughs> it has a lot of DNA. We spent a lot of time, you know, dotting I's, crossing T's. I, I would say we spent a lot of time on the whole bike, mm -hmm. uh, but I think about the process and just like the chassis, like what material do we use? Do we use steel? Do we use aluminum? You know, do we do perimeter frame? Do we do spine frame? I was for aluminum. I think that aluminum has, um, has a better future. I think that it will continue to get better. I think you have more options to make things better with an aluminum chassis versus a steel chassis. I understand the steel chassis is, uh, you know, good in certain areas, but I think that it, we've maximized its its full capabilities. I believe you you have all these things hinging on your sign off before it goes to production. It was challenging, but. And I wouldn't say stressful, but you just want to be as thorough as yeah, possible yeah. because if you get that wrong, you know we're going to be we're going to be in a, in a tough spot. When you have to make a change, it takes a long time. It's just not here we go massage this and then we go out. Yeah. It's it's not like that. Things take time. Any time we had to make a call like that, it was it was painful, but we knew that it was just to make it better when these things roll out onto the uh, showroom floor because you know you only have one chance at a first impression yeah, yeah. and we knew that th when this thing hit the f showroom floor coming out of the gate it needed to be right so you asked about how much goatness is in this chassis I mean a lot mm -hmm. a lot you know and, and making sure it's right so that a person that just rides on the weekend you know not not a racer that yeah. right or a rider at your level or my level like it needs to be good for everyone and so I had that in mind as well. Over the past year, we've on the channel ridden a, a few examples of bikes from companies that tried to establish themselves in motocross and off-road riding. Did you guys look at those bikes and those projects, and those failures, and learn lessons and try to avoid what they did? And Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's important for us, you know, when we're going into a new market, you only get one chance to make a first impression. We are 100% committed to delivering the bike that people want. You can't help but be aware of products that have gone on in the past that maybe haven't been as successful as they would have hoped, yeah. whether that be the likes of manufacturers who have come and gone or products that people have launched and you know haven't necessarily been adopted or liked. Yeah. It's all about benchmarking what you're going to do, um, which is why we've tried to offer something that's uniquely triumph and is our own bike without necessarily trying to reinvent the wheel on things that we're doing. Is the TF250H, is it a winner, not just at the elite level, but grassroots all the way up? Do you think it is? Well, before you ride the bike, I don't want to give away too much stuff, but I do feel like we have found a, a really good balance. Now, keep in mind, this is, this is the first one ever, yep. right? And, and it took us a while to get here, but I think once you experience what you will today, and my hopes, is that you're gonna be like, wow, I understand why it took so long. I think it does everything really well. I, I don't feel like you're gonna hop on this thing and, and think like, oh man, this feels kind of like this bike. I think it has its own feel. Feels like a Triumph. Yep, it feels like a Triumph and that's the way it ought to be. Triumph is a British brand. There's a Union Jack inside of the logo. Yeah. But we're here in Florida and a lot of the marketing has been American-centric, yeah. how much British DNA is in this bike and should we as Brits feel a bit of ownership on this? Should, should we be patriotic about the Triumph? Yeah, 100%. I mean, Triumph is a British brand. Everything is designed and, you know, developed from our UK headquarters in Hinkley. 
we have an international design team working in Triumph, you know, because we pull people in from all around the world. But it, it's all designed and developed by our, our UK team with the input, you know, designed and developed by Triumph with champions. So we've developed with Ricky, with Ivan, with Clement, with Ivan, as well as various other people. Paul Edmondson's had a hand in the product with us as well, you know. Um, Chris Kiefer's had a hand in the product with us. So there's all sorts of people who have been involved in it uh, to make sure that we're delivering the right bike. But it's 100%, like I say, designed and developed by Triumph from our HQ. Ricky, thanks for your yeah, time today. And yeah. thank you for putting your time in a British brand. You bet. Um, uh, you know what, I think this is something you and I were talking kind of off, off script. I, I hope that um, a British, every, everyone in the UK, in the region there, I, I feel like you guys should be proud of this. It's an iconic brand, and, and you were even saying you brought it up. Like, in our lifetime, maybe there will never be another British brand come out with an MX, you know, SX Enduro model motorcycle. And um, I'm happy for Triumph and, and their commitment um, to, growing, to growing this industry. And I think that you guys are going to like it. I'm excited for you. So that's the bike. I've tried to keep that as snappy and as engaging as possible. But if you do have any more questions, I've got the full uh, press pack here. I've got all of the answers for your questions, I think. So drop them in the comments below if you've got any and we'll get them answered. Now we're gonna hit the track again and I'm gonna team up with um, Jordan Booker, who's a pro rider from the UK. He's on the trip with us here. He's gonna take his uh, TF250 for a spin. He's gonna throw some whips for us, I hope, and then we'll talk to him about the bike at the end. I'll give my perspective from a, an amateur weekend warrior and he'll give his perspective from a top end pro rider. Let's hit the track with Jordan. So I've got Jordan Booker with me, ex-pro racer, former GP rider, British Championship contender. He, contender, he's going to be our the guy to give us an opinion on this bike from the higher level, right? So Jordan, the, when you got on the bike this morning, what's the first thing that you noticed? What's the first thing you clocked? Just how well that motor pulls. Like it is impressive for a stock first first kind of production run they've done first try they have absolutely nailed this thing i've rode a 250 my whole career i was a little bit lighter back then so i've tried to account for the 15 kilos of weight gain with the power but no even even considering the beer belly nowadays it's 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 really impressive it pulls it seemed to me yesterday the main thing that they really wanted to push to us was the chassis yep thoughts on that yesterday was the first time last night was the first time i saw the bike right so up close the first thing I kind of thought was, if I didn't know this Triumph project ever was going ahead and someone asked me, build your dream bike, what, what would you do? The combination of the aluminium frame, the suspension, the Brembo parts and everything they've put in one piece, I'd say would be exactly how I would have built it in my head. So I know there's been a lot of speculation, people saying, oh, it's a KTM, oh, it's a Yamaha. Yeah. It's not, it is, they've built this thing from the ground up, but what they've done quite clearly and evidently is they've taken inspiration from the very best bits. They've ridden, they've ridden all the other manufacturers to destruction and they've gone, right, this is good on the KTM, this is good on the Honda, or whatever way around it is, whatever manufacturers you want to say, and they have pieced that all together, I guess kind of in a more finished and complete manner than CCM tried doing yeah, back yeah, in the yeah. day. Similar kind of idea, but there's definitely a lot of KTM characteristics. There's a lot of Yamaha style characteristics with the frame, even though it is completely different. But all in all, they've bolted the best of the best together. And I think that has given them such a competitive yeah, for sure. off, the, off the shelf, out of the crate bike. It is, it's going to be a big contender. Some of the tech on there, did you use those today? The traction control, launch control, quick shifter, thoughts on those? Yeah, I did. So not until right at the end of the day, I kind of forgot about it for the most of the day because I was having such a good time on the, one because of the bike and two because the tracks were just amazing. Uh, launch, launch control I thought was brilliant. You could feel it kind of retard in the back wheel as you went over the slippery metal surface. And then instead of it kind of spinning up and then gripping when you hit the dirt, it kind of just drove forward. I think it's the, I only did a few starts, but I feel like it was the least amount of clutch flicks 
I've ever done. So I just did a start then, last thing I've done today. I haven't done a start in maybe since 2015, really? maybe. And I've definitely never done a grid start. Yeah. And I went down the track, I was like, I ripped that. Yeah. It's, and I, I was using it's launch control, yeah. Code, yeah, right? I was yeah. using launch control, yeah. yeah. And did you use a quick shifter at all today? I did, but so I guess the main kind of point of the quick shifter is to somewhat eradicate the need to use the clutch when you're changing gear. But the hard thing for me, even when I engaged it and tried it for a lap or two, I'm still using the clutch. So it's, it's definitely a really cool little feature. I definitely wouldn't run it all of the time. Uh, I've just got so used to always using the clutch. I, I, I don't think I ever ride a single section of track without covering the clutch. So some guys I know kind of go full death grip and for them it would be handy. Yeah. Uh, it definitely works. It does its job very well. But for me personally, I was still using the clutch anyway, so I didn't really gain the benefit from it. Probably the most, the best function in traction control I've experienced on a bike. But again, for someone like myself, I almost see that as a bit of a negative because it would kind of, it would stop you from oversteering. And sometimes oversteering is needed, right? Sometimes there's gonna be some track conditions when it's wet, slippery, especially back home, where I'd imagine the traction control would come in really, really handy, especially for your lower level riders. Yeah. But for me, myself, today in these conditions, I much preferred the bike without it, but that's not to say it's not good because it did its job and its purpose very well. Yeah. Jordan, I think we'll leave it there. Thanks very much, mate. You'll have a full video on your channel, right? Yep, I've Channel's got one. Called... I'm gonna launch one. Uh, just My name, just Jordan Booker, it might be MX? I'm not even sure. It's been a <laughs> we'll while. I'm not, we'll I'm not YouTube in a while. No, we'll put links it. below to Jordan's video. Check out Jordan's antics. I've seen what you guys have been shooting today and you've been it's doing been some fun. cool stuff. And you're also doing a write-up for our friends at Dirt Hub as well, aren't you? Yeah, small write-up for those guys, yeah. So we'll we'll chat that down there as well. Oh, I appreciate it. Cheers, mate. Anyway, Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers, guys. You've heard what we have to say about the bike. Triumph wanted to build a machine for everyone. For people like me, for people like Jordan, for people like Ricky Carmichael. And I think they have been pretty successful in doing that. But how does it compare to those other machines that I mentioned at the start of the video? Well, it doesn't really compare if you ask me. Triumph haven't tried to reinvent the wheel here of this bike. They've come in with their own ideas, their own concepts, but they've just executed things very, very well. And also, I mentioned it earlier in my talk and ride piece, uh, Triumph are saying that they're all in on dirt bikes, on motocross. They've got that big, fancy facility up in Georgia, not too far from here. They've um, got the two teams. They've developed this bike. There's a 450 coming. There's Enduro bikes coming. They really are taking this seriously. Not only that, they've said that they're going to have 300 dealers worldwide, off-road dealers that are specially trained for these bikes, they're committing to having at least 300 Triumph motocross dealers worldwide by the end of this year. I said I was going to compare it to a BMW, the Aprilia, the Cannondale. Those bikes were eccentric. The Aprilia was very, very Italian. The Cannondale, although I did like it, it had its problems. Then the BMW was just weird. This is none of those things. This is a very, very good motocross bike I think. So overall I think Triumph have done a very good job here. It doesn't feel like it's their first attempt at a motocross bike. Today I feel very proud to be British. I think Triumph are going to be around in this industry for a long time. I'm going to leave it there basking in the Florida sun here at Gatorback Cycle Park. As always guys thanks for watching. My name's Max this has been 999 Laser. Till next time I'll see you at the track.